Hi, my name is Jen Dubina, and I am a museum educator at the National Museum of the United States Army. Today we are going to learn more about the Army's first diplomatic mission, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. On May 14, 1804, Captain Meriwether Lewis and 2nd Lieutenant William Clark left their winter camp in Illinois to begin what would become the Lewis and Clark Expedition. The 33-person crew would travel 7,689 miles in the span of two years, four months, and 10 days through an area between the Missouri River and the Pacific Ocean. The story of Lewis and Clark is one of discovery. Humans need to explore the horizon is a theme that carries throughout history. We have long sought to expand our horizons to fulfill a need for adventure or in a pursuit of food, shelter, or goods. And it's those explorations whose impacts and consequences have reached far beyond those initial encounters. The discovery of North America and the eventual creation of the United States was sparked from a discovery of the continent by Europeans. Americans continue this theme, and by 1800, the young United States was steadily expanding westward. When we think of discovery, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you hear the term? Discovery is sometimes characterized as a one-way exchange. In fact, the dictionary definition of discovery is to find something or someone unexpectedly or in the course of a search. However, that definition is pretty simplistic, a single entity finding something else. But the act of discovering is actually something much more dynamic. It's an exchange that involves multiple groups. And in that exchange, groups are learning about or discovering one another. So the Lewis and Clark expedition was a journey of discovery. But it wasn't just Lewis and Clark who were doing the discovering. When we expand our definition of discovery to include more than just the single pursuit of adventure and exploration, we can see that discovery can be more nuanced. Lewis and Clark weren't the only ones making discovery. Discovery was actually taking place on all sides. So in today's field trip, we are going to look at the journey of Lewis and Clark, and we are going to focus on the notion of discovery. What was being discovered? Who was doing the discovering? And what did that discovery mean for the future? To understand the Lewis and Clark expedition, we need to define it. What was the ultimate goal of this mission? By 1800, the newly independent United States occupied the area along the East Coast from present-day Georgia to the south, up to Maine in the north. And the western border of the United States, for ease of explanation, really extended to the Mississippi River. And the country continued to grow not only in population, but also economically. And as it grew, the desire for more land to spread further west became more pressing. But there was a problem. Americans didn't really know what laid beyond the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. This is a map of North America that was published by John Farr in 1651. Look closely at this map. What do you notice about the image that's on your screen? If you look at it, you can see that this is supposed to be a map of the United States. But you see that the words Virginia take up almost all of the land mass. And if you look even closer, you might be able to see the words Mare Atlantic written on the bottom to indicate the Atlantic Ocean. Also at the top center of the map, you can see an image of a person. And if you look closely, you can see that there are words written underneath it that say, Sir Francis Drake was in the area and landed. If you're familiar with Drake, you may know that he was an English explorer who traveled into present-day America and explored the West Coast in Washington and Oregon. So this is indicating that the location is the Pacific Ocean and the West Coast. And if you really look at the top of the map, you can see the Sea of China and the Indies are also labeled on it. Today we know that this map is factually incorrect, but I'm showing you the map to illustrate that at the time, no one was quite sure what was beyond the Mississippi River. By the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition, no one actually thought the Pacific Ocean was just beyond the Appalachian Mountains, but they weren't exactly sure what lay between the Mississippi River and the Pacific. In fact, many geographers adhered to a concept known as conjecture geography. 
they assumed that the second half of North America was parallel to the first half. Yet no one knew for certain what existed beyond our borders. So part of the mission of the Lewis and Clark expedition was to map that area between the Mississippi and the Pacific. In addition to mapping the continent, the new nation wanted to expand its commercial interests as well as expand its economic opportunities. President Thomas Jefferson captured these goals in a January 1803 message to Congress. In the message, he requested money to fund an exploration for a core of discovery, as he called it, of the Louisiana Territory. Let's take a closer look at Jefferson's secret message to Congress. Jefferson writes, Gentlemen, as the continuance of the act for establishing trading houses with the Indian tribes, the River Missouri and the Indians inhabiting it are not as well known by their connection with the Mississippi. It is, however, understood that the country on the river is inhabited by numerous tribes who furnish great supplies of furs and peltry to the trade. An intelligent officer with 10 or 12 chosen men might explore the whole line even to the Western Ocean, have conferences with the natives on the subject of commercial intercourse, get a mission among them for our traders, agree on convenient deposits for an interchange of articles, and return with the information acquired. Our nation seems to owe to the same object to explore this, the only line of easy communication across the continent. After listening to this, what reasons do you think that Jefferson gave for undertaking an exploration into the Louisiana Territory? It's pretty clear that the first thing we hear is to establish trading houses with native tribes. So trade was very important and foremost on Jefferson's mind. The other thing that we can see in this message is that he wants to explore an easy line of communication across the continent. So the second part of the mission, as defined by Jefferson, was to find a passage to the other side of the continent and to fill in those gaps of what lays between the east and west coast of what is the United States. So armed with funding from Congress, President Thomas Jefferson set out to make the idea of an exploration of the Louisiana Territory a reality. And this had been an expedition that he had been planning both conceptually and quite literally for years. Jefferson commissioned his personal secretary, U.S. Army Captain Meriwether Lewis, to lead the expedition. Lewis had been assigned as the president's secretary in 1801, and Jefferson took him under his wing and spent the years from 1801 to 1803 ensuring that Lewis had all of the instruction he needed on botany, navigation, and cartography to prepare him for his future pursuits. Lewis then selected William Clark to serve as his co-captain. Clark and Lewis had previously served together in the Army, where they had become friends. Clark served four years in the Northwest Territory before he resigned his commission, and that experience gave him the skills necessary to undertake this new mission. The friendship between the two remained, and years later, Lewis selected Clark as his co-captain to lead the expedition. So with the expedition's leadership solidified, Jefferson issued his final set of instructions to Lewis and Clark. Let's look more closely at Jefferson's instructions. Jefferson writes to Lewis, The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River as by its course and communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean. Beginning at the mouth of the Missouri, you will take careful observations of all remarkable points on the river. The commerce which may be carried on with the people inhabiting the line you will pursue renders a knowledge of those people important. You will therefore endeavor to make yourself acquainted with the names of the nations and their numbers. In all your intercourse with the natives, treat them in the most friendly, make them acquainted with the position, character, and commercial dispositions of the U.S and of our wish to be neighborly, friendly, and useful to them, and of our dispositions to a commercial intercourse with them. So as you heard, the main objective of the mission was to explore the Missouri River and its connection to the Pacific Ocean. However, President Jefferson added some additional tasks. What are those tasks? One of them was to establish commerce with Native Americans. 
Jefferson told Lewis to make sure that the tribes they are encountering are aware of the commercial disposition of the United States and his desire to establish commercial intercourse. The other task was to inform tribes that they were now a part of the United States, and additionally, the United States was both neighborly and friendly. So as evident from his instructions, a large part of Lewis and Clark's journey would involve encounters with Native American tribes and the negotiation of trade agreements with them. To ensure those meetings with each of them went well, Lewis and Clark organized an extensive list of gifts to be presented to the tribes they encountered along the way. On your screen is a list of the gifts that the Corps brought with them. These items include things like bells and pins, beads and combs. All items were meant to entice the tribes with the promise of future trade. In addition to presents, the Corps brought with them items to display the mastery of the United States, like this Gerondoni air rifle that Lewis and Clark brought with them and used during at least 39 encounters with tribes. Whenever Lewis and Clark met a new tribe, they staged a grand entrance to impress the group. The pomp and ceremony they believed would dissuade any hostile actions. They wore their most colorful uniforms, swords, headgear, and muskets but the centerpiece was this air rifle. The air rifle used compressed air, kind of like a bicycle pump, to fire up to 22 shots repeatedly. And this was nothing like tribes had seen before. While guns were nothing new to the tribes they were encountering, they were used to muskets and rifles, which fired a single shot. As one member of the expedition wrote in his journal, upon setting off the rifle, they all stood amazed at this curiosity. So now that we've determined the mission, let's look closer at what Lewis and Clark were discovering. Where were they going and who did they meet along the way? Lewis and Clark's expedition traveled into the newly acquired Louisiana Territory. Acquired in 1803 from France, the Louisiana Territory doubled the size of the United States. And this map on your screen shows you what many people are familiar with when they think about the Louisiana Territory and the territory that was acquired. Now on your screen is another map, and this is a map of the Midwestern Indian settlements that was created by Clark in 1812, almost 10 years after the expedition, and it shows American Indian settlements in the area of the Missouri Territory. I would like you to take a look at this map. Does anything strike you about it? For myself, when I look at the map, one thing is apparent. The map is crowded. The land isn't empty. There are many, many notations on the map. And all of these notations indicate a different tribe in the area. And while it's hard to read the particular names, it shows that tribes, many of them, were living in the areas west of the Mississippi. So it wasn't empty. 10 years earlier, Lewis and Clark were exploring an area that was already inhabited by many groups. It was a land with established cultures, economies, and politics. And the people living in those lands would also be discovering. They would be discovering Americans for the first time, and they would also be trying to fit these Americans into their way of life. And in some cases, that way of life already included Europeans. So let's take a closer look at some of those tribes that the Lewis and Clark expedition encountered along the way. Lewis and Clark left Camp Dubois at the convergence of the Missouri and Mississippi River in present-day Illinois in May 1804. As the Corps of Discovery traveled north, they encountered traders, sometimes accompanied by Native Americans, making their way south. They met with tribes including the Odo and the Missouri, but it wasn't until October when the expedition spent an extended period of time with any of these tribes. In October, the Corps set up winter quarters along the Missouri River at what came to be known as Fort Mandan, named after the tribe that inhabited the area. The Mandan and Hidatsa villages are the first group that Lewis and Clark spent any period of time with. Let's take a look at the image on your screen. This is a rendering of the Mandan village that was produced in the late 1800s. And while this is long after Lewis and Clark arrived, the drawing can tell us more about the tribe. Looking at the image, what do you notice? Some of the things that you may notice is that there are a lot of dwellings and they're located near the water. 
speaking of water, there are also boats in the water. The Mandan were a nomadic tribe until they settled in North Dakota near present-day Bismarck around 1450. And they settled along the Missouri River where they grew beans, squash, sunflowers, tobacco, and corn. But their social and political and economic life revolved around the villages, which you probably noticed in the image. Mandan and Hidatsa villages were comprised of circular huts surrounding an open space. Another thing that you may have noticed is that there are boats and people in the water. The Mandan and Hidatsa tribes were the center of Northern Plains trade, attracting both Native Americans and Europeans from great distances on land and foot. As historian James P. Ronda described, at that market, one could find Spanish horses and mules, fancy Cheyenne leather clothing, English trade guns and ammunition eagerly sought by villagers and nomads alike, and the ever-present baskets of corn, beans, squash, and tobacco, upon which Mandan and Hidatsa economic strength was built. At trading times, especially in late summer and early fall, the villages were crowded with crows, Cheyennes, Kiowas, and Arapahoes, along with representatives from European companies, like the Northwest Company and Hudson Bay Company. As a result, many were multilingual and fluent in many tribal languages. So by the time Lewis and Clark appeared at the Mandan and Hidatsa camps, some Canadians were residing in the villages as tenant residents. So these tribes were well aware of Europeans, they traded with them regularly, and they already lived among them. The Mandan and Hidatsa welcomed the expedition. They helped the Corps select the location for their winter camp, and they visited them regularly to go hunting and sharing food and stories. They also provided the Corps with maps and information about tribes and the land further down the river. Fort Mandan was also where the Corps was introduced to Sacagawea who would come to join the expedition when her husband, Toussaint Charbonneau, was hired as an interpreter. Sacagawea was Lemhi Shoshone. She came to the Hidatsa tribe after her and members of her tribe were attacked and taken prisoner by the Hidatsa. Sometime between 1801 and 1804, she and another Lemhi Shoshone captive were purchased by Charbonneau, a trader with ties to the Northwest Company. Sacagawea made significant contributions to the mission's success. Twice she performed what might be termed guide services in late July and early August 1805 when she recognized important geological features on the way to find the Shoshone camps. On the return journey a year later, she accompanied Clark and provided the explorer with valuable information on what has since been named the Bozeman Pass. But her most important role was as translator. Have you ever played a game of telephone? Communication among the Lewis and Clark expedition often worked like a game of telephone. Lewis or Clark would say something, which would be translated by an interpreter to a native language, which would then be translated by another interpreter to another native language, and so on, and so on, and so on. So interactions between tribes and the expedition could take some time. Sacagawea often worked as part of a long, cumbersome translation chain that took each native word through many speakers. Just like Lewis and Clark, who were recording their observations of the tribes, the Mandans were also discovering the core. While the presence of whites was not new, the Mandans spent the winter trying to fit these new people into their own understandings and networks. The Mandan were traders their livelihood dependent on maintaining trade relations and the appearance of Americans and the promise of trade goods appealed to them. So discovery was taking place on both sides that winter. Lewis and Clark were documenting and studying the tribes for the first time, while the tribes were studying the expedition, trying to determine how their discovery would fit into their world. In April 1805, Lewis and Clark left the Mandan and Hidatsa villages to continue their journey westward. Along the way, they encountered more tribes, including the Lemhi Shoshone, before coming to the Bitterroot Mountain Range, part of the Rocky Mountains. The passage through the Bitterroot Mountain Range and the Rocky Lolo Trail, which was a 200-mile stretch of the mountainous terrain, proved to be one of the toughest parts of the journey for the Corps. As Clark recounted, I have been wet and as cold in every part as I ever was in my life, 
Indeed, I was at one time fearful my feet would freeze. Coming out of the mountains, the Corps had their first of two encounters with the Nez Pierce. Nez Pierce was the name given to the tribe by Europeans. The Nez Pierce called themselves Nimipu, which means the people. The Corps, however, called the tribe Chapanish, which is what they misheard the Nez Pierce referring to themselves. After crossing the Rocky Mountains, the Corps had entered into a new linguistic area for native tribes. So none of the interpreters on the trip knew the Nez Pierce language, which can account for the name confusion. The Corps encountered the tribe twice on the journey, first in 1805 as they traveled towards the Pacific, and again in 1806 on the return journey. Aside from the Mandan and Hidatsa tribes, Lewis and Clark spent the most time with the Nez Pierce of any other native tribe. The Nez Pierce inhabited the area of present-day Washington State, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. They lived in seasonal villages as hunter-gatherers, taking advantage of the natural resources in each region throughout the year. Take a look at the image on your screen. What do you notice? You can see water and boats. The Nez Pierce both hunted and fished, using their horses to hunt and gather wild roots and berries. Their seasonal villages consisted of multifamily longhouses as big as 15 feet wide by 100 feet long. The Nez Pierce provided the Corps with much needed food, including dried meat, fish, and berries. They even entrusted the tribe with caring for their horses while the Corps continued by boat to the Pacific Ocean and the party would retrieve those horses later on their return journey to the Rocky Mountains. On that return journey, the expedition stayed with the Nez Pierce for a few weeks while waiting for the snow to melt. And it was during these encounters that the two traded, shared stories, and played games together. During these encounters, the Corps came to know Twisted Hair, the chief who was instrumental in helping them complete their journey. Twisted Hare, who was about 65 at the time, was one of the first Nez Pierce to encounter the Corps of Discovery. Twisted Hare showed the Corps how to make canoes, he drew maps of the Columbia River, and he even accompanied the party for the first part of their journey down the river. On the journey, he served as an intermediary between the soldiers and other tribes. He would travel ahead of the party to announce their arrival to other tribes and he stayed with them into the Dallas, which was a major Native American trading location in Oregon. And afterwards, he personally cared for the Corps' horses until they returned the following spring. Well, from the perspective of Lewis and Clark, this discovery was successful. The Nez Pierce viewed it quite differently. Recounting the expedition through oral history, Otis Half Moon of the Nez Pierce explains, when they came through, they said they discovered my people. In actuality, the Nez Pierce people, we knew where we were. We discovered Lewis and Clark. Those were the ones that were lost. Due to their location, the Nez Pierce had not encountered Europeans physically before. However, that does not mean they did not know of their existence. Tribal trade on the western side of the Rockies included trade goods with English and Spanish traders. The goods included valuable guns and ammunition, which the Nez Pierce were eager to obtain to maintain their territory among other tribal groups. Though they were interested in trade, the Nez Pierce were not enthusiastic about the Corps' first emergence from the Bitterroots. Nez Pierce oral history recounts that among the male chiefs, the consensus was to kill the party, who they saw as potential invaders. It was not until a woman in the tribe asked the men to let the Corps live because she had been treated well by whites in the past. She told the chief, those are the people who helped me. Do them no hurt. The expedition's success is directly related to the Nez Pierce, whose mercy allowed the expedition to continue. The Lewis and Clark expedition ended on September 25, 1806, when the party finally returned to St. Louis. Discovery does not exist in a vacuum. Discoveries impact not only those who participated actively in the discovery process, but also those who happen to be in the pathway of discovery. And those impacts or consequences might be felt immediately, and they can also remain for generations. Let's take a look at Lewis and Clark's discovery and what it meant for those on the journey, those who benefited from the journey, and those who were indirectly impacted by it. 
First, there were the immediate discoveries, which President Jefferson detailed in another letter to Congress. This letter is on your screen. In this instance, the letter contains primary information about the geography of the area as well as the people, animals, and plants encountered by Lewis and Clark. As Jefferson wrote, On the 8th of April, 1805, they proceeded up the river in pursuance of the objects prescribed to them. A letter of the preceding day, April 7th, from Captain Lewis is herewith communicated. During his stay among the Mandans, he had been able to lay down the Missouri according to courses and distances taken on his passage up it. Additionally, as part of the expedition, the plants, the animals, and all other specimen that Lewis and Clark documents in their journals were sent back to Philadelphia and Monticello for future study. Some say they discovered over 200 new plants and animals. Lewis and Clark also counted Native American tribes as part of their discoveries as well. They both took extensive notes based on Jefferson's instructions on tribal dynamics, what they ate, how they dressed, and what their family structures were like. They also took notes on how each group traded. The journey also had major impacts on map making or cartography. While the land and people had existed in the areas for centuries, None of that information had been documented or mapped, as we talked about earlier. Lewis and Clark used their experiences to document the land and put it on the map. And this allowed Americans to see the land for the first time. The map that's on your screen now was produced by Clark following the journey. It was the first reasonably accurate geographic description of the land west of the Mississippi. From his journey, Clark was able to show how the Rockies were a tangle of mountain ranges and that the Western rivers were not the navigable highways many believed, completely dispelling this myth of conjecture geography. The Lewis and Clark expedition also started the notion of manifest destiny, the American belief that the country was destined to extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific coast. And to fulfill that destiny, additional explorations of the country were undertaken including General Zebulon Montgomery Pike, who explored the Spanish borderlands of the Louisiana Territory, Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, who surveyed the Pacific Basin, and General John C. Fremont, who led five expeditions into the West from 1824 to 1854. On the one hand, the discoveries of Lewis and Clark ushered in new economic growth and exciting opportunities. But Lewis and Clark's discoveries of American Indian tribes created significant losses. The loss of human life, the loss of access to land and water, loss of wildlife habitats, and a loss of cultural ways and identity. Detailed maps, reports about the natural resources, and details about the indigenous populations they encountered made it easier for others to travel west. Just four years after the expedition, American traders began moving deep into the Louisiana Territory to exchange goods with Plains Indian tribes. It also led to the discovery of new diseases in those areas. An outbreak of smallpox in the Mandan villages almost completely destroyed the tribe just a few years later in 1837. And it also led to the loss of land and the complete destruction of bison herds. As you can see, the Lewis and Clark expedition had lasting impacts on both the United States and Native American tribes, showing that discovery impacts everyone. Thank you for attending this presentation of the Lewis and Clark virtual field trip. I hope you were able to learn more, not only about the journey itself, but also many of the Native tribes that were impacted by the journey. And hopefully it makes you question your own definition of the term discovery.